up on where we left off last time. Um, we were going over using SQL on web pages to retrieve data from a database and therefore making our pages database driven. So we'll spend a minute going over the example and then we'll go from there. Remember, we're going to talk a little bit of theory, a little bit of SQL, and then um, a little bit of uh, actually implementing what we talk about in ASP.NET. But I want to make sure that we have this down because I don't expect you seeing it once to be able to duplicate it. Um, I know the lab is um, used for people doing their homework assignments, um, but you know the lab can also be very effective for you to try out stuff that we talked about in class. Maybe try to duplicate my example. You know, that would be one way. One thing that you could do in, in your lab time. Uh, that way, if you run into difficulties, you can um, you can view it and, and, and ask questions and, and have me give you some advice right off the bat, as opposed to going off and trying to do the assignment. So even if you're not ready to do the assignment, just try to duplicate what I've done in class. That's one good usage of, of the lab time. Anyhow, let's look at what we have here. Um, website. Remember to open the appropriate folder. Um, that still trips people up a few times. So you want the folder, the, the folder is going to have your app data and your bin folder in. We open it from there. I'm going to try to fast forward through this example because we went over it last week, but I do want to hit the high points of it. First of all, Notice that my database is in an app data folder. There's my database. If you create the file, uh, the the, the uh, website and then move your database in, you have to hit refresh to view it. So it is in. The app data folder, app underscore data. That specific name is sort of important because that's what the default folder name is for where it expects to find databases. So if I were to just drag this in here, you wouldn't be able to see it through Visual Studio until you went and clicked refresh. But since it was there when I opened it up, you can see it. All right, so app underscore data. You go in and create a page. I create a page called Faculty List. I also created, and this would be a great idea to do so, a master page that you can use and put all your stuff together on. A lot of the assignments we're going to do in this section of classes are going to build on each other. So your first lab might be to do a list of everything. Your second lab might be to do queries uh, where you only pull things of certain categories up and so on, or do a search by author or something like that. So um, because of that, we want to have something to sort of bring everything together. So create a master page that's going to have your navigation. Create a home page from it. 
and then each of your pages, each of the add-ons that you have to the assignment, you can add it to the navigation on the master page and create a new page. So in this case, we have a master page, we have a home page, and we have what we were looking at last time, which is a faculty list. Now, when we run this, <coughs> we get a list of the faculty members that were on the database. So we only had three. All right, so we see them. The nice thing is, though, again, we have the ability to bounce between pages. So we created a master page. And again, it's also an, exa uh, an opportunity for you to uh, practice creating master pages. Because we only did that once, right? You have to do something several times for it to, um, for you to really understand it and really be able to do it. So um, create a master page and add stuff to it. All right, if you're going to look at this page, we're going to notice that there's really two components on this page that are important. And we can view them in the code view, and we can view them in the graphical view. They are a grid view and a SQL data source. This is going to be very common that we're going to have sort of two things working together when we have database interactivity. We have the source of the data, the data source. And it is a SQL database data source, so it's a SQL data source. That provides the data. We then are going to have some visual way of showing the data on the page. And those things are bound together. Those things are matched up. Um, it's sort of carrying on the philosophy of having components, having a component that each does its own thing. So all our SQL goes in the SQL data source. The appearance part of it goes in the view, in our case is a grid view. So the SQL data source, if we look at, we have to first define, and we'll do this again. We'll sort of fast forward and recreate this example in a minute. All right. We create a SQL data source. We have to supply a connection string to do that. What I did is I simply went down and picked the database that was in the account uh, or the uh, app uh, DB file. We can then supply the SQL that we want to have. And I custom coded it. And mine simply says select star from faculty order by last name. I can hit next and test that query to make sure that the database query part of it works. I then have a grid view, which I can create and I can specify the data source behind the grid view. This is what sort of marries the two together. This is what binds the two together. You can take the same piece of data and show it in a couple different ways, even on the same page. All right. Or you could have some data on your page come from one place, from one SQL statement, other data come from a different SQL statement. All right. So there's a lot of possibilities of what you could do with this. And therefore, when you define the SQL data, you have to say how it's going to be displayed on the page, what visual control is going to do it. By default, it creates a grid view and supplies all the columns. You can then go and customize it. You can also go in and put CSS code if you want, which is what I did here. Um, I made the THs in my table the color red. All right, I'm going to do this again. Repeat what we did last time more or less. Just to show you the process from beginning to end. So I'm going to say new file. I'm going to pick a web form. I'm going to call it faculty list 2. Select a master page. My master page. 
And we get that again. Remember, when pages that are derived from the master page, we only get those content views. All the common code is going to be in the master page. And I'm going to update the master page to include the second faculty list page, which I can do through the GUI, or I could probably just as quickly go through the code view and change it that way. recreate that. I'm going to do that by first dragging over my first component, which is SQL data source. This is where the data is going to come from. I configure it. I specify the connection to the database. There should be one connection per database. You shouldn't have multiple connections that point to the same database. Now, this is where I can't show you what we did last time because we already created our first connection. So we're not going to do the exact same thing. What I did last time is my database appeared in the dropdown and I selected it. All right. What I'm going to do this time now is I'm not going to say new connection. I'm going to go and click on the connection string. That's going to connect me to the same database. I then specify what data I want, and I can either write my own custom SQL statement or I can use sort of a query builder to go and say, well, I want these columns, these columns, and these columns. At least now we're going to use, at least this time we're going to use the custom SQL again where I can go in and I can specify select star from faculty order by last name. I can then test the query, and it can show me if it's right or not. If I got something wrong, I misspelled last name, for example. If I do that in test query, it gives me an error. All right? And sometimes the error is descriptive. Sometimes the error message is not descriptive. In this case, there was an error executing the query. Please check the syntax of the command, and if present, the values, types, the parameters ensure they are correct. No value given for one of the required parameters. That really doesn't make sense, right? I spelled the column name wrong. What does that mean, no value for given parameter? Well, I could give a long explanation. The bottom line is the error message that it gives are, is not always intuitive. Do the obvious things, though. Make sure that your syntax is right in terms of the form of a SQL statement. Select from, select columns, from table, order by, something. That's the main, that, that's the form. There could be a where clause in there. There could be other clauses in there. Make sure you have those in the correct order that was defined. The other thing is make sure you've spelled everything right. All right? So, uh, in our case, we didn't spell something right. So, we're going to find it pretty quickly and correct it. The other potential issue is sometimes you have column names that mean something special in SQL. For example, if I called a column in my database select, all right, that wouldn't be a really good idea, first of all, but let's say I did. Well, if I try to select that column and I said something like select, select from faculty, SQL's going to freak out. Because it's not, it's going to think I'm trying to do some sort of weird double select command, right? So if you use a SQL command or you use a reserved word, um, a real common example of that is with the, with order, right? Because order is the order by clause in SQL. But a lot of people making tables might make an order table, like someone ordered from our company, all right? So it's a very common mistake. And so if you create a table called order, it's going to think that it's an order by clause. And it's not correct, so it's going to blow up. What you can do if you ever have a, a column that you think might be uh, confused with a column name uh, or, or a command name, put it in square brackets. 
and that will usually fix it. So select, if I had a table called order, I could say select star from order and just include the order in square brackets. And that, would, that usually takes care of it. If you can't figure out what else is going on, sometimes if you go and copy the statement into access and run it, it will give you a more descriptive error message. So like what I can do here is I can copy this, go into access, create a query, go into SQL view, paste in my query, and run it. All right. That's also kind of weird, right? Because it just popped up a, a little message box asking you to put in a value of last namer. All right? When you see that pop up, what that's telling you is it doesn't know what last namer is. It thinks it's a parameter when you wanted it to be a column name. So that at least narrows it down to what's wrong as opposed to just telling you something's wrong. All right? So we can go in and we can fix the name of this column and run our query builder and, oh, I'm sorry, not the query builder, test query. And we can see, okay, we corrected it. We can hit finish. All right. So now we have our SQL data source. But remember, the SQL data source is just retrieving the data. We want to display the data, and for that we're going to use a grid view. So I'm going to go and drag this grid view there, and I'm going to specify the SQL data source, and it will default the layout to that, which I can go in and edit new columns and change the defaults. I could get rid of columns. I could rearrange the columns. I could do anything I wanted to. And now if we go and run this again, we get our second version. All right. So that's in a nutshell what we did last time, except for creating the, the query string. One thing about creating a query string, though, is your query string should look like this. It's going to be in your web config file, and it's going to look like this. I said query string, I mean connection string. Notice how data source, after the words data source, there is the two pipes, the two vertical lines, and the word data directory. All right, by default, that data directory is my app data folder. This is what you want to see. You don't want to see the actual physical path, like C colon slash user slash mzellers slash desktop slash college site slash app underscore data. You don't want to see the actual physical path there. You want to see the vertical line, data directory, vertical line, and then the name of the database. The reason for that is if you have the actual physical path there, it'll run on your machine, but not run on anyone else's. So when you turn it in to be submitted, uh, when you submit it to, you know, for a grade, I'll go and try to run it, and if I don't have the exact same folders named the exact same way as you do, it's going to blow up. And chances are you're not a user on my computer, so I'm not going to have your username and your paths, or if you put it on your thumb drive, I'm not going to have your thumb drive in, lab, in, in drive E and so on. So I'll get an error that way. If you do it this way, then I can go and I can download it onto another machine and it, will, it, it ought to work. All right, questions about this. This is important. So the key points of this, the connection string, one connection string per database. You're always going to have the two parts of it, the SQL data source and the visual view. Those have to be bound together. All right, now that's showing one table at a time. But the whole idea of databases is that we have data about multiple entities. And we have relationships between those entities. 
And those relationships are not implied. They're explicitly stated in the database. All right? Back in the old days when you had, when you had what are called flat files, the relationships weren't defined. They were implied. In other words, you had to be smart enough to know that the customer number in this table or in this file meant the same as cust number in this other file. And you had to write the code to match up the customer from this file with the customer from that file. Databases are better because not only do we store the data, we store the relations. So, let's add another table to our database. We have a database with one table. And that is faculty. I'm going to go to design view to see actually what it looks like. We have an auto number key. We have a first name, last name, the office, an email address, and the hire date. We talked about last time how important it is to put all the constraints in the database. So if a field is required, you ought to define it as required in the database. All right. So first name is a required field. What that means is I can't enter a person without giving them a first name. Now remember, it didn't give me the error right instantly when I skipped that field. It gives me that error when I try to save it. And in Access, you try to save it when you go to another row. So if I try to get to another row and I've entered a person without a first name, it's going to give me an error. All right? So I would have to fill it in and we'll say John Adams. Now it's going to complain that there's no email. And I have to supply a value for that. And I have to supply a higher date, too. Now I can go on to the other field. It's important to define those constraints because the idea of those constraints is by hook or by crook, you can't put in bad data. All right? You just can't put in bad data. All right? It will not allow you to define bad data. So we build those constraints in the database. So it doesn't matter what application is trying to write to that database, those rules will be enforced. Okay, now let's talk about relationships between one table and another table. All right? Now, let's say every faculty member has a department. So right now, we have a table that says faculty. And in it, there is the faculty ID. First name, last name, office, email, and hire date. All right, let's talk about adding some tables to this, all right? Let's say that every faculty person can only belong to one division, which I think is probably the rule, all right? Every faculty person only belongs to one division. And every division has a dean, all right? Every division has a dean, all right? Person in charge of the division. If we were going to draw the entity relationship diagram, it would look like this. Faculty has a relationship. Let me just draw the entities, and then we'll define the relationships. Division, and Dean. 
One of the things that we have to come up with is what's called the cardinality of the relationship. What is there a relationship between here? What entities have a relationship here? The faculty and the division. Faculty and division. What else? I'm going to draw a dotted line there. Faculty, ID, and dean. Because I kind of do, right? There's one person that is my dean. All right? But we're not going to put that in as a relationship. And we'll explain why in a minute. What else is our relationship between? Dean and division. Dean and division. So in other words, let's put some real data in here. Zellers is faculty member one. My division is engineering, business, and IT. The dean of that is Kelly Zelesnik. I'll put her email up in there in case you want to say what a great job I'm doing. All right, so you know who to write. All right. Now, it is true that that person is my dean, right? But I don't need to define a relationship for it. Why not? Because I belong to this division. This division's dean is this person. So this is the, the relationship between faculty and dean is what's called a derived relationship. In other words, the reason that Kelly is my dean is that we are both part of the same division. She's the dean of the division and I'm a faculty member in the division. So that is the important relationship to capture in the database. All right? It would be similar to the relationship between student and teacher. Yes, I'm your teacher, right? Because you're here in a class and you're listening to me. All right? But really the important thing in that relationship is that we're both part of the same class. I teach the class, you're a student in the class. So therefore, you're not going to, eliminate, you're not going to implement the relationship between faculty and student you're going to implement the relationship between faculty and course and student and course. All right? And in that way, you can, if, I, if I had to give a list of all your professors, I could do that. But I'd get it through the courses that you took. Likewise, if I want to know who my dean is, or someone wants to know who my dean is, you get that by going through the division relationship. Why not implement both relationships? It's redundant, all right? If Kelly were to transfer to another division, for example, um, there'd be a bunch of things you'd have to update then to take her off me as my dean and put in whatever division she's a dean with and then put her on all those faculty members if she were, say, to become the dean of math and sciences, all right? And then uh, you'd have to go and put the new dean, it would just be a mess to update it if you implement all the real relationships that exist, therefore derivable relationships. Another way, to, <coughs> excuse me, another way to say it is that's a form of redundancy. It's enough to know that I'm a faculty member for this division and she's a dean for this division. And in that way you have the connection between me and my dean. So the cardinality of the relationship says if it's a one-to-one -one relationship, a one-to-many relationship, or a many-to-many -many relationship. All right? Most of the relationships you're going to have in a database are going to be um, one-to-many. And to test that, you look at the relationship and you say one of these can have how many of these? One of these can have how many of these? So, one faculty member belongs to how many divisions? Just one. All right? So, you show that. Sometimes you put a one over here, or sometimes you just leave it like that. One division, however, has how many faculty members? Many, right? Now, here's the thing in databases, right? There's only really three numbers in database relationships. Zero, one, and many. All right? That's the only numbers that exist. Really, the only
only numbers you need to worry about are one and many. In other words, if a division can have two or three or eight or however many faculty people, we don't care about the exact number. We just know that it can have more than one. And in which case we say it's many. So we usually show that by putting an M here. The other thing we can do, the other way we can show the same thing is this way. Where this little thing is on the many side and this is on the one side. All right. So those two things mean the same thing. All right. Now, relationship between dean and division. One dean can control how many divisions? Just one. Each division has how many deans? Just one. This is really a one-to-one -one relationship. And that's relatively rare. All right? Most relationships you see, when push comes to shove, you find out that many relationships that you think are one-to-many or I'm sorry, that you think are one-to-one, -one, are actually one-to-many. All right? Um, you just really have to think of all possibilities when doing that. But in the case of a division and dean, yeah, that's only one. You know, you're not allowed to teach. Or, or I'm sorry, you're not allowed to be uh, more than one uh, dean of more than one division. All right? It'd be like football coach and team. Or, or head football coach and team, right? Each team only has one head coach. The person as a head coach is only the head coach of one team. Because that'd be crazy, right? What if they were playing each other, all right? They'd have to, like, be going back and forth between the sides. It just wouldn't work, all right? Sort of the same idea with deans. So, we have what's called a one-to-many relationship. So, for faculty, we're storing the faculty ID the first name, the last name, office, what was, what else did I say, email, and hire date. For division, we're going to maybe store division ID. We're going to store an abbreviation. Maybe we're going to have a description. Maybe we're going to have an account for it. Account for purchases, right, in the accounting system or whatever. All right. So we're going to have a bunch of things that are associated with the division. Now, we have not yet implemented the relationship between division and faculty. How do we do that? We're going to add a column to something, at least one thing. Maybe, maybe more than one thing, maybe not more than one thing. What do we add a column to to implement this relationship? How do we show that a faculty member belongs to a certain division? Key. A foreign key. All right. So specifically in this case, what would the foreign key do? Tie division ID with faculty member. Exactly. So how would we do that? We have two choices. All right. We could put a division ID in the faculty table, or we could put a faculty ID in the division table. There might be other options, but I'll tell you, this is, you know, is one of those two options. You put the key here, so I could put the division ID here, or I could put the faculty ID here. Which one do you think we want? I like the first option. You like the first option. Does anyone else like the first option? So you don't like the second option. First option is correct. And this is one of those things that I'm going to try to explain it to you.
But the good news is, is if you don't understand my explanation, there's a rule that you can follow. All right? Here's the idea. A division ID can only point to one division over there, right? So I could have two faculty people from the same division. So me and Doug are in the same division. So this can point to one division, which is fine, because a faculty only points to one division. What would be the problem if I put the faculty ID over here? If I put a faculty ID over here. Exactly. Which, like, let's say one is me and two is Huber. And one over here is EBIT. And if we have a faculty ID over here, whose ID do you put in? One or two? There's only space for one faculty ID. But we know that the division can have more than one faculty person. But there's only little space for one faculty ID. So we know that that can't possibly work. This, on the other hand, can work. Because me, Huber, we both have a department for one. All right, a department of one. So we both work at the same department. So logically, it makes sense. Another way to look at it is the, 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 the entity on the many side can point to the entity on the one side because there is space for one value for the key over there. So you can point to one division. A faculty member can point to one division, and that's fine. If I put the division, uh, the faculty ID over here, that division can only point to one faculty, and we already said that it's a one-to-many relationship. So, if that makes sense to you, great. If not, maybe it will make sense to you at some point. But if you want to roll to memorize, the many side can point to the one. But the one side can't point to the many. All right? With one field, you can't point to a bunch of faculty people. You can only point to one. Now, you might say, well, could I put faculty ID 1, faculty ID 2, faculty ID 3 here? And the answer is no. That's a bad idea. That's violating what's called one of the rules for normalization. One of the rules for normalization says you don't have repeating fields. All right? And that would be repeating fields. I'd have more than one faculty ID. All right? Now, what's wrong with repeating fields? What's wrong with repeating fields? What if I had 10 slots in there for faculty in a division? Well, if I had faculty ID 1 and 2, for example, I could put in me in position 1, Huber in position 2. So each one of them would have its own value for the primary key. What would be wrong with that, though? It's already done in the faculty. Well, yeah, that would be saying that we got rid of this column. Well, I understand more faculty than that. What if we gave 10 slots and there was 11 faculty people? Do you have another slot? Well, that's if there's 12 then. That's if there's 15. Whenever, that, that's why we say many means many, right? Many simply means more than one. We don't want to have to be in the business of guessing how many that's going to be or how many that could be, all right? Because we could always run into a case of if we guess 10, Sure enough, at some point in time, a division is going to need to hire an 11th faculty person, right? What would it be like if they needed a faculty person to teach a new course that they added, but, oh, all 10 slots are filled in? You'd be running a business based on poor database design, right? Instead, you've tried to build it with the ultimate flexibility. That doesn't matter how many faculty people you have. If you have 11 of them, they can all point to this division. If they have a 12th, the 13th, the 14th, they can all go and be part of that division. Does that turn it into a many-to-many? -many no. A many-to-many -many would be something like if I 
was in the engineering division and I was in the arts and humanities division. All right. Now, it's possible for people to teach classes in two divisions, but you sort of always have one division as your home division. All right. So, yeah, there are faculty people that may teach in this division and that division, but there's still only one home division they belong to. Many to many's we'll, we'll get to uh, in, a, in a bit. All right. We're only talking about one to many now. And this will be an example of a one to one. We'll cover this probably at the end of today or maybe next time. So, it's not enough just to put a column in here that says division ID. The other thing wrong, by the way, with listing all the different values is that would make everything more complicated. Reports, searches, queries, everything more complicated. So we're going to do something that's flexible and simple. We have a division ID that points to the division. All right. It's not enough to have a column named division ID in this table. That doesn't really establish the relationship. You have to define it as a foreign key. And what does it mean when you define it as a foreign key? It means that you can't put a value in this column that doesn't match up with a value in the division table. So let's go and do that data-wise, and we'll play around with it a little bit, and then we will implement it in um, Access, and then we'll do something in ASP.NET for it. So, I'm going to leave Dean, I'm going to leave Dean off for now, and we'll, we might come back to Dean today or on Thursday. I'm just going to add the division table in now. So I'm going to go and add a table. I'm going to go to design. I'm going to call that table division. So primary key is going to be division ID, auto number, abbreviation, full name, let's say, and what else did I have up there written? Oh, this is good enough. All right, we can get the idea. You got abbreviation description in the count. Okay. Yeah, the, the, well, this will do. Yeah, the, we'll, we'll just do these. Okay, so we're going to save this. And I'm going to put in a couple divisions. So we have DBIT, which is engineering business and information technology. A H Arts and Humanity now one thing I didn't do is I didn't go in and put in the constraint saying what's required and all that that's still a valid statement to make that you should do that just in the interest of time I'm not always going to do it <coughs> but you definitely should when you define a database table okay so now I'm going to go and add to the faculty table a column for division ID. Division ID is an auto number in that table, so I'll make it a number in this table. It's not an auto number over here, right? If you think about it, that makes sense. An auto number means that the first division gets number one, the second division gets number two, and so on. Does our first 
faculty person automatically belong to Division One, and our second one automatically? No. So we just want to be able to put in a number. All right? Now, when we do that, we still have not defined a foreign key. Still have not defined a foreign key. All right? Just because we put a name in that matches a name in the other table. We have to actually go and create the relationship. So, you create the relationship by going in under create. And I lied. Database tools. Relationships. You can pick both of these tables. Add. Notice that from the database's perspective, there's no connection between those two. All right? They happen to be named, named the same thing. But you know what? They could, there could be two tables with first name in it. So the same column name doesn't mean that there's necessarily a foreign key. So we have to establish that foreign key. And we do that by dragging this onto that. You will nearly always click Enforce Referential Integrity. The only time you will not do that is if you're building a database by importing things like an Excel spreadsheet. And you might have bad data, and you have to clean up that data before you create the keys. But that's not our case here, right? So we are going to go in and create the relationship. I say it for referential integrity. Cascade update related fields is less important. Cascade delete related records is important. But we're going to skip that for now. All right? So notice that, but we're going to we're going to skip that for now. So I hit create. And notice what it did. It drew a one to many relationship. It doesn't do an M, it uses a little infinity sign. That's an acknowledgement that many simply means, you know, unlimited. You know, as many as you have. If you ever do this and you, you get the things going in the wrong direction, it's not that Access made a mistake or you have to do something different in Access. It's that you probably de designed your relationship wrong. You created the keys wrong. So I've had a lot of students like ask me, like, how can I change that to be pointing in the other direction? All right? You can. Access is smart enough to know that this is a one-to-many relationship. How? Well, because I know that one division ID over here can only point to one division ID over here. Because division ID is a primary key. And so if there's a one here, there's only going to be one row in the division table that has a value of one. So it has to be a one to many going this way. All right. So now I can go and enter data in. So I can go into faculty and I can enter data in. Because I've established a foreign key, I can't put in a value that doesn't exist in the, t in the division table. So if I try to put a three in here, it gives me an error. I can leave it blank. All right. Well, that's because I did not specify division ID as being required. Now, you might think about that. Well, should it be required? Well, maybe. But when we just added it, we can't add it and make it required right off the bat. Right? Because if we add it, there's nothing there until we go and enter it in. So the best we can hope for is to enter everything in and then go back later and add it. All right? So, um, I'm going to go put us three in there. I'm going to put good old John Adams in Arts and Humanities. He'd probably be teaching history, I would think. All right? Unless you're talking about the other John Adams, which should be teaching music. All right? But that's, both of them are probably still in Arts and Humanities, right? No, they would be in, history would be in social studies, whatever. He's in Arts and Humanities now. All right. Now, a couple other things. Now, I can't enter in an invalid value. I also 
cannot delete a division if there are professors associated with it, faculty members associated with it. Because if I was able to delete division one, there would be three faculty members that are still in that division, right? What would happen to them? Therefore, it won't let me delete if there are faculty members still in there. The reason it won't let me delete is because I did not check the cascade delete box. We'll talk about that more in the future, all right? But you're not allowed to delete something if it's required for a relationship, if there's data for that division in this case. Now, I could go in and add a new division, division of ABC alphabet. I can go and delete that one, no problem. Why? Because there's no faculty assigned to it. All right, I just added it a minute ago. But I could not delete division one or two because there are faculty assigned to it. All right. Now it would probably be good to go in and make that column required. So I'll go here and I will say that it is required. Now by virtue of the fact that it is a foreign key, it automatically makes an index for you, which is a good thing. All right. It's telling me that I changed a rule, so it has to verify that the rule is valid. In our case, it's not going to take long because there's only three professors, so it closed it quickly. But if I tried to make it required before I filled in everyone's division ID, it wouldn't let me do that. All these constraints in the database relating to foreign keys are called referential integrity. It's to make sure you don't have a faculty person that's associated with a non-existent division. Because then the data has no integrity. All right? You know that that can't be correct. You can't have a faculty person associated with division 10 if there is no division 10. You just can't. All right? Now, when you enforce referential integrity, it might be wrong. I might have uh, assigned John Adams to the wrong division, but at least John Adams is in a division, all right, which means that it could be right. Remember, the database can't read your mind and ensure that all the data is 100% accurate. But there's some kind of things that the database knows just simply isn't right, like having a professor associated with a non-existent uh, division. Okay, so now what? Now we're going to do a query in ASP.NET that brings these two tables together. All right? So we're going to show the department uh, name, and we're going to show the faculty name. So we're going to do a list by department. All right? So I'm going to go into my ASP.NET app. I'm going to create a new page. <coughs> and I'll call it Faculty Department. I'm going to select my master page. I'm going to do almost everything the same, except my SQL is going to look a little different. Let me go and add that to my master page, just so I don't forget.
So I'm going to go and add my SQL data source, configure data source. Now I'm going to click new connection. I'm simply going to grab my old connection string, right? Should only have one connection string per database. Next, I'm going to specify a custom SQL statement. And my SQL statement, I'm going to write in Notepad so that we can read it. I'm going to say select first name, last name, full name from Free Food College Center. What are we doing here? No, I'm just kidding. From department. Actually, it's division, not department. Faculty. Where? We're going to use a where clause here. You can use a where clause for a couple different things. One of the things that you can do is you can use a where clause to connect two tables together. To say what columns in what table matches up with what columns in this table. Now, sometimes students are a little confused by this because we defined it as a foreign key. You might think that it might automatically connect it in our SQL statement. It doesn't. We still have to say how faculty members and departments or divisions are connected. So, I'm going to say we're faculty division ID equals division, division, ID. Then I'm going to say order by full name, last name, first name. All right, let's break this down. Remember, what we've seen before looks something like this. Select a list of columns. These are all columns from the different tables, right? This is from the faculty table, this is from the faculty table, this is from the division table, right? I can say first name by itself because the division table does not have a column called first name in it, all right? Same thing for last name. And I can say full name by itself because the faculty table doesn't have a column that's just named full name. The entire column name, the entire name of a column in a database is actually the table name dot column name. It's just like each one of you has a first name and a last name, right? Now, if I were to say I'm trying to, trying to think of everyone's names in here. Can I say David? Raise your hand. All right. You, you're also named David? Yeah, okay. That's a problem now, right? Because who was I talking to? All right. Now, if I gave your first name and last name, you'd know who I'm talking to. All right? David Ramirez, raise your hand. All right. Same thing with database columns. If there's two columns with the same name, I have to give the table name and the column name. All right? If there is only one person, is there another Mike in the room? Okay. I say, uh, Mike, am I talking to myself or am I talking to you? All right? Who has a unique name in the room, do you think? and we know it means them. I apologize for not knowing your names better, by the way. All right? If I say Bryce, I only need to say Bryce because in this room, there's only one person named Bryce. There might be someone in another classroom named Bryce, but they don't matter because they're not in this room right now. All right? 
Same idea here. I can specify a column only by the column name if I'm sure that that's the only column between these two tables that has that name, that there's only one of them. So first name is only in the division table. Last name is only in the division table. Full name is only in, I'm sorry, I'm saying it backwards. First name and last name are only in the faculty table. Full name is only in the division table. All right. So I can say, specify the columns just by giving the column name. I can always give the full name now. All right. Even if there's only one David in the room, I can say David Ramirez and you know that I'm talking to that person, even if there wasn't another David in the room. All right. Now with databases, you have the advantage that you can't have two columns with the same last name and first name. Right. There could be somewhere in the world another David Ramirez, whereas in our database there can't be a column that has the same table name and column name. All right, so this is a list of columns I'm pulling off, and I only give those columns their column name because I know that there's only one column that has that name. This is the tables that are involved, division and faculty. Order by, we've seen before. The difference is the join statement. And here uh, is, we're using a where clause to join these tables together. There's another way that we'll look at as well. With the where clause, what we're saying is we're going to match up the division and faculty table using the division ID. All right? So, how do we know what division goes with what faculty? Well, we know that we want the one where the faculty's division ID matches the division's division ID. Now, for division ID, I have to give the full column name, table name and column name, because there are two columns named division ID. And if I don't put that in, the database doesn't know which one I want. So let's go and put this in in my select statement. Next, test query. All right, works. All right, finish. I can now go and grab my grid view. Choose a data source. And when I run it, it will show me the data on that site. It's sorted in the order that I asked it in. In other words, arts and humanities is before engineering. Within engineering, the names are sorted by last name and then first name. All right. Next time, we're going to talk about what could go wrong with this query. All right. What are some of the things that could happen that could cause us to get bad results? We'll talk about that next time. Are there any questions about this right now? I see the notepad. Yeah. Select columns from tables. The where clause matches up the, the columns from one table with the column in the other table. And finally, order by is the sequence it's going to be in. All right, I'll go unlock the door, let you in the lab. Then I will be back and grab the files, and then I'll be back in the lab. Yeah, is that weird? Yeah. <laughs>